You know, when we open up the Word of God and break it open, and like the Lord said, I want you to eat it, devour it, break it down, and let your soul digest it, and let it nourish the parts of you that need it. And when that happens, what's absolutely fantastic and amazing is the same words spoken in time and space will go out into your soul and your soul and my soul and show up a little different. So what we're going to do today is a fascinating study because we have reviewed these texts already in the book of John. For as John saw and perceived, he had a powerful message for us. But if you compare how he devours and digests the Word of God to how Matthew and Mark digest the same story, the same experience, we have a different angle on this diamond that is the Word of God. This diamond, when you look into a diamond, the light reflects off it, and from one angle you see one facet, from another angle you see another. And today we're going to open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 14 and Mark chapter 7, comparing them and learning what there is to learn in this passage. We begin this section actually in the beginning of Matthew chapter 14, and we're tying several stories together for deep meaning. We begin by noticing that there is a miracle, a miracle that takes place. The miracle takes place in a dry and thirsty land. And it begins by explaining to us the nature of the dry and thirsty land. And chapter 14 starts with an amazing picture of everything lavished and good in this life. You start with someone named Herod who is at the pinnacle of his career. He is at the height of things. He is all-powerful. He can do anything. He can have anything he wants. And he does. It begins with this great feast. And they are celebrating having a party on a Saturday night. And there's all kinds of pleasures in the space. And he is delighting himself with what he can see, and he is delighting himself in what he can eat. Meanwhile, the Bible says, he has tucked away quietly into the prison cell a man who had been challenging the comforts of his lifestyle. John the Baptist was out in the wilderness being a wild and crazy man, standing in the depths of the river of the mighty power of God, calling out into the dry and thirsty land to wake up the people who do not know that the comfortable, lavish scenarios they are enjoying really leave them in a dry and thirsty place beyond their knowing. And he didn't want to hear this voice. And those at the party didn't want to hear this voice because John was challenging a relationship in the story as not okay. So anyway, he took John the Baptist and tucked him away into the prison so he can continue enjoying his day. It was Herod's birthday, and a dance occurred, and he was so delighted by this moment, he offered anything, anything. And the head of John the Baptist was delivered on a platter. Our miracle begins with this imagery. And in verse 13, it says, Jesus heard what had happened to John, his cousin, who could see that he was the Lamb of God, who could see through the smoke and mirrors of this world we find so comfortable and lovely. And the disciples met with him. They both withdrew to a private, solitary place. And they grieved. They grieved for John. 
They grieved for themselves. What does this mean for us as we try to continue to preach this great message? And they also grieved for the land and all the people, not knowing how thirsty they really were. So it's at this point in time and with this attitude and with this contrast that the crowd begins to follow. The crowd begins to follow. And in this version of the story, the crowd didn't come just to hear good words on the hill. The crowd came because you see a great contrast, and this is often true in our society, it's a great contrast between those who are wealthy and those who are not. And those who are not came looking for healing, looking for help for the deepest part of their souls. And the Bible says that they came, and I have this image on the screen to present for us a more modern picture of a crowd gathering. This is a, a moment in our American history called the Civil War, that internal battle, the Civil War, the battle inside a country. And the battle inside this country left many, many, many people needing healing. And this is a picture of many wounded from the war gathering, hoping that they can find healing at a makeshift hospital with tents popped up, no sanitation, just hoping for healing. And I imagine this similar kind of situation as Jesus grieving with his disciples come to the hillside and the crowd are coming to hear him to be blessed but they're also bringing their sick and when they come in a crowd of 5,000 men and 20,000 people all together it's a crowded place not sanitary sick people lying around in agony and the Bible says in Matthew chapter 14 that Jesus had so much compassion on them that he went in the midst of his sermon preaching and he touched them and he healed them going by. Now, have you ever been sick? Like really one of those dog sicknesses that get you all week long, you had to take off work and you're just feeling miserable, you can't function. You cannot do anything in this moment, right? You're not yourself, your family sees clearly and you cannot function. But then on maybe day seven, you start feeling better. And when you're done with that whole illness, you're ravenous. You're so hungry. So Jesus had been walking around and somehow normal all of a sudden feels really good. And you just want to eat everything in the fridge. And the family's happy again because you're, you're starting to live again. You're starting to wake up again. Well, Jesus had gone around to this massive crowd and he was healing people. Every other conversation around this massive crowd. And the end of the day had come and they were starting to feel a little better. And they were ravenous. And the disciples said to them, let's send them all home so they can go to their own locations and get food in their villages. And Jesus said, you feed them. And the miracle took place, and the loaves and fishes were distributed to 20,000 people. And that's how Matthew begins the story on the lake. That's how Matthew sets up the story, with this big contrast between those that think they are healthy and are not, those that aren't and receive him, and it's, it's all about what's happening in our heart. So it's the end of the day. Jesus continues on in verse 22, and he sends the disciples on the lake. And they begin heading out, same as the other story. And Jesus stays aside, and he goes to a mountaintop, and he begins to pray, spend time with God. And they are on this lake. It's the end of the day. 
Matthew says, verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Walking on the lake. The disciples see this figure coming towards them. They think it's a ghost, and they are terribly afraid. The waves have begun to toss and turn in the dark, dark night, and they are afraid. But something different happens in this story that doesn't show up in John, Mark, or Luke. Only Matthew records this story that you know and you've been taught ever since you were a kid in cradle roll. Because there is one disciple in this story that sees the aberration coming and is also afraid in the boat. And hears a voice, verse 27, but Jesus immediately calls out to his beloved disciples and says to them first, take courage. Have courage, family of God. For it is I, the son of the living God. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Those three phrases can change everything in the heart of a disciple. And Peter cries out at the edge of the boat. Can you feel it? Imagine you're him. You're you're on the side. You grab the edge and you're looking. You hear his voice. And the Bible says he calls out and says, Lord. He doesn't say Jesus. He says, Lord, master of my life by choice. Lord of my life by choice. If it is you, if it is you crying out, teaching me to have courage today, if it is the Lord of my life calling me to have courage today, If it is the Lord of my life saying, it is I revealing God to me, calling me and teaching me not to be afraid of whatever this life has to deal. If it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. On the water. Now, what an amazing leap of faith Peter has to cry out in this way. Jesus looks at his disciple who has that mustard seed of faith, that little bit of faith. Are you that kind of... All the rest of the disciples are sitting snug in the boat. And when they tell the story, they don't say anything about this moment. Are you the kind of the disciple that's going to sit in the boat waiting for him to come? Or are you one of those courageous disciples of Jesus looking like Peter at the edge of your life saying, I want more. I want more than this shallow version of life. Have you come to church today with the waves tossing and turning in your life? Have you come today knowing that if you really believe in a God that is that big and that loving, that he cannot teach you how to walk on top of the waters of life differently than the King Herods of this world? Finding the sweet spot in life that is not given over to materialism, but manages it well, is not given over to the pleasures and hungers of this world or the desires to please a neighbor or to please a family member when it comes to loving and living big for God. Jesus, if that is you today saying, I want to live different, Father. I want to live in that sweet spot no matter what comes my way. I want to know that no matter how long my days are here on this earth, that I lived in the sweet spot of your love. To you today, like he said to Peter, he said the most amazing thing, one word. Come. What? We're asking for something outrageous, family of God. 
to walk on water in this world? It's impossible. It cannot be done. We don't have the power in ourselves, but Jesus looks out to Peter, and he sees the little tiny seed of faith, the hope in his heart that he can, the desire to have more, because he sees in Jesus a different thing. Jesus, who had no place to rest his head. Jesus, who did not seek power and authority on this earth. He saw something different, and he wanted to walk on water, like Jesus does. And Jesus says to you and I today, come. Not this kind of walking on water. Yeah, we think some days, I just want to be safe in the arms of Jesus. Jesus, thank you for all that you've done. And we go to church and we put our arms behind our head like a good vacation, kick our feet up in the boat. And we just want, we just want him to just calm the waters so we can drift downstream safely in our boat on the lake. Jesus said to Peter, come. Because Peter's talking about this. Peter's talking about the extraordinary. Peter's talking about the unbelievable. And it will show up in the most amazing ways in your countenance when you are walking on water in this way. When you are managing the materialism of your life in this way that it does not bind you. When you are managing the relationships in your life with healthy boundaries that protect your spiritual relationship with God, but you live so big that they can't help but love you because you're loving so big like him. Walking on water in a dry and thirsty land on the lake. So the Bible says then Peter got down out of the boat because it wasn't a shallow little canoe. It was holding at least 12 or more people, right? And all those baskets, 12 baskets left over of food. He had to climb out, down, down out of the boat to step on the water. He is so elated that Jesus said, come. He probably didn't expect that. But in his faith, he heard, come, and he ran towards Jesus. Then Peter got down out of the boat, and he was walking on water. And he came towards Jesus. Peter was walking on water. Walking on water. The winds begin to blow a little. They were already blowing, but he notices. I'm walking on water. What's the first thing we do when the Lord blesses us with something amazing? We have a little piece of success in our life. Things go kind of good. What do we do? I'm walking on water. You think about you and what you're doing. At first, he was all about Jesus. I'm coming. Call me to you. And he jumped out, jumped down, and he was headed towards Jesus with his eyes on the Father, the one teaching him courage, the one teaching him to fear not. And all of a sudden, that felt good. And he looked to pause for a minute and consider himself in all his glory. If you're walking on water, you don't want to slow down. I just have a feeling. <laughs> and, and he... Uh, in the desire of ages, begin to contemplate himself on the water. Now remember, he's the only one that said, Jesus, let me come to you. So I wonder what he was thinking all of a sudden about his friends. They're still in the boat. And so he looks back. We do that. We do that all the time. We look back. Do you see me now? I am looking good on the water, John, beloved of Jesus. Yeah, sons of thunder, look at me now on the water. And somehow the focus on self takes over. You cannot walk on water, Jesus is trying to say, by focusing on self. The prayer Grace prayed one day, if I could 
use her prayer. Dear Father, take away my selfishness is such a primary, crucial, to-the-point kind of prayer we must all pray. Jesus knows Peter won't get far. He knows. And when Peter begins looking at himself and at his disciples and the self-focus takes over, his courage begins to waver his fear begins to set in again, and the lordship of Jesus is distant from his mind, and he finds himself sinking into the depths of the bottomless pit of the sea. Jesus says to him quickly, and is immediately, verse 31 says, Jesus is immediately there reaching out, because Jesus knew. Jesus knew that our little mustard seed of faith will get us so far until the condition of our souls show up again. We cannot walk on water without the Son of God. We cannot master this life without Him. For He knows how to change it. But we must be with Him in all things. And we must be praying that prayer, Dear Father, teach me how to live this life in a way that it's not about me that it's not about me. What problems did you bring into church today? When we are wallowing in our problems, I tell you 100% of the time, it is all about you in it. How you feel, what you're thinking in it. Jesus is there for you this minute. And he is reaching out his hand, and I want you to see him grabbing your hand. And I love this image. I have a painting of this that I purchased that I look forward to hanging up in my office of Jesus looking down into the water. And you imagine you are the one coming back up for help, sinking down into the bottomless pit, having turned on your own thoughts again. And he has grabbed your hand one more time, will not let you go, and pulls you back up to the surface of the water. He is there for you. For Peter cried out, Lord, Save me, I'm in that spot again. I like how King James puts this particular response from Jesus. You of little faith. That's not a put down. No, because remember, just a mustard seed is all you need. You of the faith of a mustard seed, Peter. You who had that much faith to say, let me come, and I said, come you, that guy who has a little pinch of faith that will allow you to move mountains, will allow you to walk on water, will allow you to change your life and become new again and master that sweet spot of eternal life I'm here to offer you, you of the faith of a little mustard seed. At what point, at what point, moment did you begin to doubt? Our current versions say, why did you begin to doubt? Which is a similar final end point, but I like this point because it's important we reflect at what moment did you begin to sink? Because that's the key. You were walking on water, Peter. Remember? You did it! You were coming towards me. At what moment? Was it when you stood a little taller for a minute? You looked back to get approval from your friends? And you began to think it was all about you again? And how that would change your future? And you took your eyes off the sweet spot of holy living and made it all about you? I imagine what it was like for Peter holding Jesus' hand going back to the boat. The disciples aren't looking at him. Hey, Peter. Yeah, you kind of sunk at the end, didn't you? Good try, but keep working at it. He had a little demoralized moment. And Jesus lets us have those to bring us back to center. 
But together with his Lord's hand, they climb back into the boat. And actually, Desire of Ages says that they all worshipped. Actually, the disciples were like, mouth dropped down. What? We didn't even think to ask to come. It's possible. Did you know? A new idea popped in their mind. It's possible that we can walk on water like him. New day has dawned in the story of this gospel. This gospel doesn't end with them, Jesus climbing in the boat, and immediately they were to shore. This one talks of kind of this longer period of time, and I imagine with them, they are lit up in conversation, and they're enjoying their ride back to shore, for a new day has dawned on their thinking. They begin to cross over. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People again brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who would touch him would be healed. So that dirty makeshift hospital was set up again. And Jesus began walking the thirsty, dry land of people hungering for a different way. Chapter 15 is such a revelation to the mind of the sinful one who thinks about self all the time. In the name of Jesus, did you know you could do that? You could be all about yourself in the name of Jesus in this world? We have Harold, Herod on one side, at least he was not doing it in the name of Jesus. But in verse 1 of chapter 15, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, come by. And they have a question for him. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They are blind. They cannot see the miracles. They cannot see that people have turned their life around, that they have found healing and hope. They are not living in the sweet spot, for they are all about themselves, and they're worried about their status. For if the people aren't listening to them and someone else is not encouraging them to listen to the elders and our traditions, then everything I've built up about me might fall apart. Jesus, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For in this dirty, makeshift hospital of yours, you have fed the people. You have broken bread and given them fish. You have fed them. And the tradition of the elders says this. If you flip, keep your finger here, and if you flip over to Mark chapter 7, I like the detail that Mark gives this portion. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean. You have 20,000 people here, and there aren't enough ceremonial jars to have everyone pause and wash their hands before they eat. And in fact, Mark goes on to say, uh, and this causes them to be unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders on how that ought to be done. It should be done, we wash our hands before we eat. We should be clean in the name of Jesus in every way. But this was according to the ceremonial laws and traditions of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash first. When they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of the cups, washing of the pitchers, washing of the kettles, and you have this very ceremonial process on how what should happen before we gather to break bread. And Jesus has just fed 20,000 people and healed the sick, touching the unclean people, and then eating and breaking bread. 
This is bad in the eyes of the Pharisees. You know this cool picture? Isn't that a cool picture? How did they do that? How did they do that? This is the coolest of picture because it's actually a diver in the water upside down. And you see how the light's coming from above the water down? And the water's coming, the light's coming down, and the diver's underneath trying to make this picture go. Jesus takes the question of the elders and he turns it upside down. And he asks them a very important question. Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? Why are you making that sweet spot of living in the name of Jesus all about you and elevating everything about you above the commands of God? In doing so, you are missing out on the sweet things of life. And he points out an example to them in front of the people, for this is taking place, this conversation in front of the people, challenging and making the people feel unclean, that what they had gotten from God the Father was not special and they were still unclean, causing them to doubt what God has done in their life. And Jesus would have nothing of it, and he said to the Pharisees, let me just give you an example of this. For instance, the prophets of the Bible remind us that we must honor our father and mother. But you have told the people that when they begin to give money to honor their, take care of mom and dad in the home as they begin to age, and you begin, you give money to take care of your family and embrace them in your home, that that piece of money you're giving them is actually God's. And you do not allow them to take care of their mom and dad, and you call their collections of money into your very wealthy bank account. And in doing so, you are a hypocrite. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, meaning it's all about me. And their teachings are but rules taught by men. And in doing so, you will never walk on water. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. So he gathered the people around. He gathered the people around. I like how, um, back to Matthew, puts this portion. Matthew uh, says Jesus found it so important that he clarify with the people that they are not unclean now in the name of Jesus, that what has happened to them is true and good. And he has to explain something very important. So verse 10 of chapter 15 in Matthew, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean spiritually. But what comes out of his mouth is what makes him unclean, for it reveals the heart of the man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts of a selfish man. Thoughts of murder, King Herod. Thoughts of adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and lies, and slander. These are the things that make a man unclean. But eating at the feet of Jesus being healed with unclean hands does not make you unclean spiritually. Jesus called the people, his disciples, his loving disciples, to the lake to teach him a very important lesson. Not on just how to sit on the side of the lake and admire its beauty, Not to just relax downstream in the comfort of a boat with feet kicked up on the edge, but calls an invitation to those of us who have a little pinch of faith like Peter 
I've come and I think about every aspect of my life and I would really love for God to help me be on top of it. Be managing it in the name of Jesus. Be perceiving it like he perceives it and live all my days in his name on the water. Walking on water. And you say to me, uh, Pastor, it's really just not possible. For that miracle we know is just not possible. If you think dating is hard, be glad you're not a grebe. This is a picture of a grebe, and it is springtime. These North American water birds have high standards when it comes to attracting and keeping their mate. For if either the male or the female grebe cannot walk on water, they're out of luck. Springtime. That's a high calling, isn't it? So we look at each other, looking for that love of our life. You ought to expect that they can walk on water, amen? That's high calling. That's no pressure. No pressure. But in the name of Jesus, he wants us to know how to walk on water. And do you know, it's absolutely fantastic. The little creatures we have found can walk on water. They use surface tension. They spread themselves out and have really long legs. And they use surface tension to float on top of the water like a boat. But the grebe is the, the uh, largest vertebrate with the ability to walk on water. And what they do in the spring is what we call rushing. They do this maneuver where they rush on the water and where they sprint on top of the water up to 66 feet across the lake in coordinated groups for about seven seconds. They are walking on water. Is it possible to walk on water? Apparently so. The interesting thing is that uh, it takes 20 steps per second of forcible slaps with their webbed feet on top of the water, and they have this really weird kick. They have slowed it down, you know, with modern technology, we can watch it and record it and slow it down. They have this kick where their leg goes way up to their ear or something on the side, and they slap the water again, but 20 steps per second, that's pretty fast. Can you guess how fast? Humans can walk per second, taking a step. We can only do, uh, let's see, about five or six steps per second. When you go home today, I want you to practice. You get the kids out. I'm going to time you. Now, don't try this on water at first, okay? Don't start on the lake, all right? Because it's not good. Because we have recorded you can only do it. The fastest people can only do five or six steps per second. Somehow in our self-seekingness, we are rather slow with our steps, spiritually speaking. Maybe if we keep practicing the faith of Peter, that with every decision we have to make in life, we're focused on the Father. With every decision in life, when that reaction comes in your soul, someone has said something and you have flared up in your heart. You are posturing in reaction to defend your soul with the question, how dare you like the Pharisees? Or you've done something great and you start smiling and looking back at your friends, looking for their approval. All these self-centered heart, selfish thoughts slow down our steps. To walk on water, we must walk faster, focused in on the Lord Jesus as we jump out of the boat, looking at him. So we end today with a text coming out of Old Testament, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, for you know the disciples knew their word. He has shown you, O man, of little faith the size of a mustard seed. What is good? How to live that holy life in the sweet spot. And what the Lord actually requires of you 
not so much in the ceremonial presence of making yourself look good, but he actually requires of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly, not selfishly, with your God. One of my favorite scenes out of our many Pixar movies comes from one of my favorite movies called The Incredibles. A family, imagine a family with superhuman powers. Dad is strong, extra strong. He can do anything, amen? Woman has the gift of flexibility. How attractive is that? Daughter has the gift of, of boundaries and power and an invisibility when she wants, but son has the gift of speed. And his name is Dash. And he can go much faster. Do you know that you know this moment, don't you? I love this movie. And he can go much faster than five or six steps per second. And he's trying to get away from the bad guys in this movie. And, and he is up all of a sudden. He had made it through dashing like he does around all the obstacles of life. And, and he, is, he is way past them and it feels so good. But he doesn't know yet he has another power. That the speed at which he can walk will help him when he is backed up now against the cliff and against the water. And they are gaining on him. You ever feel like life is gaining on you? And you have nowhere to turn. And he faces the lake and he keeps going because he can do no other. And I love the laugh that they give him when he realizes, I am walking on water now. In the name of Jesus, may we feel his joy as we begin to focus on the selfless love of God. And watch it change our life to where we are focused on what is the most meaningful in life. And may we live big for him this week in his name, walking on water.